I want to talk to you this morning about commitment. Uh, what does it mean to commit to something? I was trying to think about this a little bit, trying to think how could I describe it in a way that would, uh, that would catch a, a few different things came to my mind. C- comparisons, ways of kind of com- comparing and contrasting the idea. Um, one, th- one thing that came to my mind was this idea. When I commit, there is no graceful way to turn back. When you commit to something, there's no graceful way. I remember when I was a kid growing up in the inner city in uh, Utica, New York, uh, uh, there used to be a craze that would kind of go through the schools at different seasons, and, and it would be this thing that you'd be going to sit in your seat in the cafeteria, and someone would come and pull the chair out before you actually got your butt on it. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Anybody? They don't, I'm sure they don't, that cannot be politically correct. I'm sure it's not happening today. For, you know, you probably, but, uh, and so you'd be going to sit down. Now, There's a moment there when you're going to sit into a chair when you still are kind of in control of yourself, in control of what's happening. But when you come to the moment that you commit yourself to that chair, do you know what I'm saying? You give yourself to that chair. If somebody pulls that chair out from under you, there is no coming back, right? You are going down. Boom. It's going to happen uh, in that kind of way. And that's the way commitment is. When you, there is no graceful way to turn back when you commit yourself. You know, uh, a lot of times uh, when that kind of thing was happening at the school, I would try and maintain control as long as possible when I was going to sit down because, you, you know, I just, you got in the habit, you know, so I have one foot in front, one foot in back, and I would kind of go back, you know, keeping where I was in charge all the way. You know, some of us live our lives like that, don't we? We don't ever commit to anything. We just always kind of keep it so we're in charge all, all the time. And, uh, and, and so that, that, you know, when I commit, there's no graceful way to turn back. Another thing about commitment is there's no balance in commitment. You are or you aren't. Uh, the idea of almost committing, how many of you know that is not committing, right? You cannot almost commit. There's no balance in commitment. You, you either are committed or you're not committed. You can't be in between in any kind of a way. Uh, commitment, another thing about commitment is commitment makes me vulnerable. Commitment makes me vulnerable. Uh, we love to watch the Buffalo Bills here in this area. And, and one of the things that you see happens with, uh, w- w- uh, when you watch a football game is you'll, you'll see sometimes where you know, a receiver will be kind of running through the, the, uh, the other lines and, and, and positioning himself. There are people all around him. And the, he gets spotted, and they're, they're going to throw to him this pass. And he knows as soon as he touches that ball, they are going to be smashing him as hard as they can. Do you know what I'm talking about? And uh, you can see this kind of look in their eyes sometime. If you're, as, you're, as you're watching it, you can see their, just their posture, just the, that there's this moment where they're hesitating. Do I commit to catch the ball? Because if I catch the ball, I'm going to have to fully extend myself, and I am going to be very vulnerable to a smash. If I get hit, I'm going to, I'm going to get hurt. And, and, and they're in this moment. Do I commit to catch the ball, or do I pr- try to protect myself? Sometimes they, they don't catch the ball. But the truth is, just like in that moment, commitment always makes you vulnerable. When you commit to another person, when you commit to a situation, all at once there's a vulnerability that exists in your life that was not there before. Another thing about commitment we could say is this. Commitment always costs me something, right? Commitment always costs me something. There's no such thing as a free commitment. You know, we're here today and those that are online, and, uh, and the fact is we would not be here today if a whole bunch of people had not gotten up real early this morning, are you with me, to make this thing happen. When you made the decision, when you committed yourself to the church, right, you, you know, all at once you're going to be in church. That's, it's, you made a commitment, right? It cost you, it cost you your Sunday mornings, right? I can remember when I... You know, there is actually a world that goes on outside of church on Sunday mornings, you know. I, I, I remember when, uh, 
after 20 years of pastoring, I was free on a Sunday morning. Not free, I still went to church, but I went other places too, right? Where usually my Sunday began 5 o'clock in the morning and, and would go all day long. So, so I remember what a weird experience it was for me to drive and to see all these stores filled with people. These, these, there's a, there must be a religious, a religion around Home Depots and things like that, because those places are packed out on Sunday. You know, it's, it's, it, it, it's an amazing thing. There's a whole other world out there. But you made a decision, and the decision you made was, you know what? We're going to prioritize this thing. We're going to, we're going to come to church. Uh, that's going to be our thing. We're going to do that thing as a family, as an individual. We're going we're gonna to do this thing. We're going we're gonna to come. And when you did that, it cost you something. You're all at once. You're not free on Sunday mornings. The people who made the commitment to make this service happen today, it's tied them up from early in the morning till now. Why don't we give a hand to all the people who made that commitment and, and got things together so we could be here uh, today. It's a, it's a powerful thing. Well, well, I want to. I've talked about some contrasting, some ideas, but let's talk about biblical commitment. What what, what are we really talking about? If you if you have your uh, uh, access to a Bible or uh, scriptures uh, on your phone, if you can self control yourself not to be searching all over the place there on there, uh, we're going to look at Luke chapter fourteen. Luke chapter fourteen, and uh, I'm going to start with verse twenty five. Luke chapter fourteen, starting with verse twenty five. And uh, this is all in red letters, what we're going to be reading, meaning that it's the words that Jesus spoke, right? And uh, so we're going to be looking at us together. Luke chapter 14, starting with verse 25. Now great multitudes were going along with him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Wow. I'm thinking to myself, that should not even be in the Bible, right? That, I mean, I'm saying to myself, no, that's not, Jesus, Jesus loves our family. You know, he, he wants, you know. I, 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 I'm thinking to myself, if I got up and said that, in this climate that we live in, and Politico got a hold of it, you know, the newspapers, you know, got a hold of it or something like that. You know, pastor says, hate your family. It, are you with me? Can you see the headline right now? Come on. If I posted that on Facebook, they would eat me alive. Are you with me? Am I right? Right? Hey, but what does but Jesus say? Jesus doesn't seem to care. He says, if anyone comes to me, and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And Jesus is calling us here and he's saying, look, every relationship in your life has to be placed before Below, I should say, your relationship to me. Every other, every relationship, there is no relationship that you have, he said, that, that can be in competition with your commitment to me, with, with your heart to follow me, with going after me. And this is very important for us to understand within the context of family because there's many relationships that, that simply do not work if they're put out of order. That is, for example, if I love my children more than I love God, you can, you can read the Bible. There are all kinds of stories of people in the Bible who love their children more than they love God, and it never worked out in a good way. It's always very destructive. And you would think, what is more dominating than the love for for my children, right? You know, that kind of thing. But he says, you know what, that has, to, as a matter of fact, you can't even be a good parent if you love your children more than you love God. Why? Why is that? Be because there's going to come times where your children's desires and God's desires come into conflict. 
And if you choose your children's desire over God's desire, it will produce destruction, right? You know what I'm talking about. You know, and we're going, I'm going to this party on Friday. It's going to be great. Everybody's going to be there. Our whole class is going to be there. It's going to be really wonderful. And Oh, really? Uh, well, where's this party going to be? Well, it's going to be at Billy's house. His parents are away in Hawaii. Isn't that something? So we just have access to the whole house and everything. Really? Oh, really, really? Well, who's, who's the, what's the adult supervision in this situation? Well, I don't know about that. I don't know. What, you know. Well, you know what? I don't think you're going to that party. Everybody's going to be at that party, Daddy. Everybody's going to be at that party. Well, everybody may be at that party, but you're not going to be at that party. I, I'm not sending you to a place where there's not adult supervision. There's not something that's going on in that. T- what? You, I'll be you. You don't know what this will do to me. You know, well, I don't know what it will do to you, but I'm telling you, Daddy's not sending you to that party unless there's people there, there are responsible people that are in that. Oh, I hate you! Door slams. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? And now, if I love my child more than I love God, when that door slams, I'm going to myself, okay, I don't want them to be hate me. That's so terrible that my kid would hate me. I, I don't want them to hate me. And, and so I would, you know, well, honey, what do you think we should do? You know, and I, almost, I compromise everything that God has taught me are you with me? I compromise everything God has taught me now because I, I want to, I, because I have this problem. The problem is a, a disordering in my heart is I have a love for my children that's higher than my love for God. Is this making sense to you? Okay, so, so you know, this, this idea that relationships need to be uh, born out of this commitment to, to, to the Lord. He, he's speaking to us in this whole passage about commitment. Look at verse 27. He says this. For whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Now, when we hear that expression, carry his own cross, we think of a cross. We think of a cute girl with a little gold chain and a little tiny cross around her neck. And we think, oh, what a beautiful thing that is. But that's not, that's not the context that this is being spoken in. When he, The people he was speaking to, if he said to them, whoever does not carry his own cross, they had a very graphic image that immediately would come into their minds. It was an image of an experience that they have mad, may have had when they were on a street in Jerusalem and and, and, and uh, I've been on some of the streets there, not much more than from here to the front row of seats. And, 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 and down would be coming a crowd of, of uh, Roman guards. And they, and, and they would have with them a person who was condemned to the cross. And that person would be carrying their cross down that, that street. And, and when that would happen, you would press yourself against the wall. You wanted this thing to go by you. You did not want to be identified in any way what was happening. Because if that guy was going to a cross, he was a criminal. He had done something bad. There was, you know, he, this was bad people. This is a bad situation. The last thing you would want is the guy with the cross on his back coming down the coming down the thing, carrying the cross, and then when he gets near you, stopping and looking up at you and going, Hi, Mike. You know, you don't want that. Because this is a bad person, and you're trying to... He says, whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me. It, you, there has to be a willingness to lay down our reputation, right? Uh, you, you, a, a willingness, because when, when that happened, your reputation is totally destroyed in that situation. And then he goes on, and he, he, he says something here. He says, for which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation... And is not able to finish, all who observe it begin to ridicule him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. 
And so he, he's talking to us about commitment. He talked about commitment in relationships. He talked about willingness to lay down our reputation. Some of you have had to lay down your reputation at work. Everybody's going out to some bar after work or something's going on, and they're inviting you to come along, and, and you're thinking, you know, how am I going to connect with these people if I don't do this, and what's happening? And, and, but maybe you've made a decision. Maybe God has dealt with you and, you, and, and, and said to you, for you, I'm not saying this is every single person, but for you, God has said to you, you cannot be going to bar. You know, you cannot be doing it. So he said that to you, and now you're in this situation. Am I going to let my reputation die? You know, so they look at me and say, oh, well, he doesn't, you know, he doesn't hang out with us. Or am I going to stand with the thing God has spoken to me personally? Am I going to commit to that? He says, you, you cannot follow me unless you are willing to lay down your reputation. And then he says to us, and this laying down, this, this committing that takes place, it's not meant to be an emotional thing. He's not, he, says, he says, for which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and count? He says, don't do this thing. Don't commit yourself to this in some moment of emotion. You know, you hear a, a tearful story, something, oh, yes, okay, I'll follow you, Jesus, you know. And, and he says, don't, he says, count the cost. Take a moment and stop and think about, okay, what is this going to mean to me? The Lord is telling me not to go to these bars. What is this going to mean to me in my work, in my situation? How is it going to impact me? And then count the cost. Maybe think of other ways that you can connect with people. If, if you can't do that, right? You kind of come up with it. He says, you've got to calculate this thing out. You've got to think this thing through. Otherwise, you get into the middle of it, and it says you get ridiculed. Why? Because the man began to build and was not able to finish. And then he wants to emphasize this point so much that Jesus repeats the idea again. He throws it at us again. Verse 31, what does he say here? He says, or what king, when he sets out to meet another king in battle, will not first sit down and take counsel whether he is strong enough with 10,000 men to encounter the one coming against him with 20,000. Or else while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks terms of peace. He's saying you got to count the cost. When, before you get into this thing, you gotta, when, when, when you're going into a situation, when it's somebody with few going against somebody who has much, there's going to be a consequence. If you lose that fight, there's going to be a consequence for you. And so he says, look, before you do this, before you commit to walk with me, before you commit to follow me, before you commit to do this, he said, you got to think this thing through and you got to say, am I willing to pay the consequences? Loss of reputation, loss of who knows what. Am I willing to pay the consequences of this before you get into the battle? And then verse 33, he goes on, he takes it another turn, going after another dimension of commitment. He says, so therefore, no one of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possessions. So he's talked about relationships. He talked about reputation. He's talked about counting the cost. This is, a, this is Jesus's, this isn't Mike talking. This is all red letters here we're going after, right? It's shocking. Some of it we would say, get the black marker out, take that verse right out. This is, the, you know, hate your father and mother. Get, get that's. It's shocking, but it's the truth of what Jesus has called us to. He says, therefore, no one of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possessions. Why is that? It's because possessions have a gravity to them. They have a pull to them. And if you don't break the power of that pull, possessions will drag you places, draw you places you don't want to go. You, in, your, in your commitment to Jesus and your following of Jesus, you don't want to go. Possessions have that pull. All possessions are like this. I remember years ago we were, I decided I was going to put up a swing set for the kids. You know, I'm super dad. I think I'm going to be a great guy here. 
And, and so I dedicate my weekend. I, I put up the swing set, a lot of work involved, everything else that, in making the swing set happen. And then I, I feel pretty good about it until I get to the final page of the instructions. And on the final page of the instructions, it says this to me. It says, now, now you, you, know, you got your swing set up. It says, every week you need to check these bolts bump, 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 in the thing. You know, every month you need to lubricate, blah, 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 blah. You know, every, you know, and I, it was like a page of these things. I looked at my wife, I said, I thought I bought a swing set. I bought a life commitment. <laughs> it's going to affect me for the rest of my life now, right? Taking care of this swing set. And that's the way these things are. They have a, they have a power, they have a pull that's there. And then... Jesus ends this section off with a passage that has been very confusing for commentators over the centuries because it appears to say something that is scientifically not a fact. And uh, unless you study the times and the situation, you won't be able to understand exactly what's being said here because this is what it says. Look at verse 34. He says this. Therefore, he says, salt is is good. Now remember, the whole passage we're talking about commitment. So I'm going, okay, then he's still talking about commitment here. He says, therefore, salt is good. Commitment is good. But if even salt has become tasteless, with what will it be seasoned? And this is the thing that is a little shocking, this little phrase here. You know, he says it's useless either for the soil or for the manure pile. It's thrown out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. He's saying something here. He's saying the salt becomes tasteless. Now, the thing about this is this is just not reality. Salt is always salt. Right? If you have a container of salt and you put it in the in the uh, uh, cupboard and you come back 10 years later and you pour it out what do you have you have salt you never hear somebody say oh this salt is old I'm getting rid of it right the salt it stays the same it doesn't it never you never say say somebody go and they eat their salt and they go Oh, that salt, it must be over six months old because it just is not, it just doesn't taste salty anymore. You know, you never hear that. Why? Because it never changes. Salt is salt. It is what it is. It is salt. And it never spoils, never rots, never goes stale, never, you know, any of those things. It is salt. That's, that's what it is. So this is, seems like a contradiction because he says here, if the salt has become tasteless, with what will it be seasoned? And so it's like, okay, what are you talking about, right? Because the salt never becomes tasteless. What are you talking about? And what he's referring to here is something that, we, you remember at this time now, salt was not a commodity like we experience where you go to the market and buy your container of salt, that kind of thing. Salt was a very expensive item. And if I, as a trader, got myself a load of salt that I wanted to sell, one of the things that I would commonly do is I would cut the salt, meaning I would take the salt and I would mix in something with it that kind of looked like salt but wasn't salt so that I could, you know, if I was selling a pound of salt, so to speak, I, I would actually get a little margin of profit there, a little extra margin of profit because it wouldn't be 100% salt. It would be cut in some kind of way. And so what would happen sometimes is as several traders interacted with the salt, each of them having the novel idea that they would cut the salt, they would compromise the salt in some way, even when it finally made it to your home or your family, you might say to yourself, I don't want my kids just eating this stuff, you know, this salt like crazy here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut it a little bit so it lasts longer, right? And so it gets cut, it gets cut, it gets cut. Each time this happens, nobody really quite knows that it's happening. Nobody really quite connects with exactly what's going on. But the salt gets cut, it gets cut, it gets cut. One day a person shakes the salt out and they go, this salt seems tasteless. What's happened is 
there's been a, been a, been a compromise that's gone on over a period of time, little bit, little bit, little bit, until finally the salt has become tasteless. And Jesus says, if the salt is tasteless, what is it good for? He says, it's worthless. Either for the soil or for the manure pile. The salt has become, t- it's, it's, it has no value at all. And what he's talking to us about is the nature of commitment. Now here's the deal about commitment. All commitment deteriorates. You can make the most passionate, wholehearted, consecrated commitment to Christ, but over the course of time, there will be forces that will work to deteriorate the nature of that commitment. You make little decisions here, little decisions there, where you cut the salt. It's not you know, it's not like you've turned your back on Jesus or, you know, you know, it's not like you're saying, well, I'm just changing my whole direction of my life. Or It's not the way it happens. It happens this, this process. And this process happens all the time. It, 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 commitment does not have a staying power. Commitment has to be reestablished. Unless the commitment is reestablished. Now, now, as I'm saying this, you're listening to me, and you're, some of you, you might be struggling a little bit in your thinking. But l- let me say it another way, and I think you'll, you'll begin to see what I'm ta- talking about. How many of you believe that a little child can give their life to Jesus? How many of you think that? How many, how many would you say, yes, I believe, you know, I believe that, okay? All right. Now, if a four-year-old gives their life to Jesus... They make a commitment that is within the framework of the life that they have at that time as a four-year-old. Who they are, opportunities they have, temptations they have as a four-year-old. They make a commitment to Christ as a four-year-old, right? But when that four-year-old becomes an eight-year-old, how many of you know that the commitment that they made, I'm not talking about anything about Jesus' commitment to them. I'm not talking about them losing their salvation. Or, and that, they're, that's, they're secure in all that. What I'm talking about is their commitment, their salt. How many of you know that the commitment of a four-year-old is probably not going to hold you when you're an eight-year-old? Are you with me? And probably what needs to happen as an eight-year-old they need to recommit themselves. Does that make sense to you? And how many of you know that the commitment of an 8-year-old probably is not going to hold you when you're a 12-year-old? You with me? Now, when I'm a 12-year-old, I'm going, there's a whole new world that's opening up to me, new opportunities, new temptations, new new issues, and I'm probably going to have to meet the Lord afresh as a 12-year-old. How many of you know that An 18-year-old, are you with me, is probably the commitment they made as a 12-year-old is not going to be sustaining, are you with me, unless it gets renewed in some kind of a way. Does this make sense to you? Okay. Um, I can remember uh, years ago, I, I, I bought my first Actually, my one and only brand new car. It was 1984. A, a Nissan, it was a Nissan something, a wagon. Little Nissan wagon, 1984, brand new. You know, maybe it cost five or $6,000. I mean, it was, I was thrilled over this car. I mean, this, this was the thing. Now, I had grown up, I told you I grew up in the inner city. My mother didn't even have a car. Right? When I, I grew up in a single parent home, my, we wanted to go someplace, you called the cab. You took a bus. Nobody had a car. That was like crazy. And here I am now, I'm a young married guy, and, and uh, I buy a new car, you know. And that baby is sitting out in our little parking lot for our apartment where we were, and it's sitting out there. And, and I'm going out there polishing that baby and, you know, just taking care of it. And, you know, it's our car. You know, it's our new car. This is a beautiful, uh, my car, you know. And I'm feeling pretty good, feeling pretty proud. Well, 
One day, my little son, at that time, probably about, uh, uh, pr probably uh, uh, maybe four or five years old, you know, in that bracket, Toby. Toby is out there, and he's playing in the stones in the driveway out there in the parking lot, playing in the stones. And he, he wants to show me something. He's got his little hands full of stones. He runs to me. As he runs to me, when he gets near the car, he trips and falls into the car and slides down the side of the car with the little stones in his hand. And I'm like, ah! Toby, look! Ah! You know, and Toby's like, ah! you know, just a little guy, you know. I said, Toby, Toby, go in the house right now. Go in the house right now. I want him to go in the house because I don't know what's going to come out of my mouth. I'm like, I am like livid, right, in the, this situation. And I'm out there with this car, and I'm looking at it, and Toby's crying, ran in the house, you know. And, and, and I'm out there looking at the car and just like, oh, I can't believe this, you know. And, and, uh, and, and the Lord comes to me, and he speaks to me. And he says, when did you start? Loving your car more than you love your kid. I said, what are you crazy? I don't love my car more than I love my kid. What are you talking about? He says, well, by what I just saw, it looked to me more like you were more concerned about the car than you were about the, your child. And, uh, and I was like, oh, man. And I just stopped. And I just said, Lord... I commit this car to you. It was easier to do now that it was scratched. <laughs> you, 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 you know, I said, Lord, I said, I commit this car to you. You, you know, you are number one. You're the number one. This possession is nothing. You know, it's not more than my child. I commit this car to you, to your purposes, to wherever you want to use it with, whatever you want to do. I commit this car to you. See? What am I saying? At a new season of life, the commitments that I had before, the level of commitment, was not enough for the new place I was in. Are you with me? Everybody here is in exactly this same boat. You made a commitment to Christ. Some of you could get up here right now, give tearful stories of the Lord's work in your heart and when you made your commitment to Christ, and it was, was it complete? Yes. Was it, whole, was it holy? Yes, absolutely. Was it, was it powerful? Yes. It was so meaningful, so much, meant so much to you, meant so much to the Lord. It, it was all those things, but the problem is that commitment on that day is not enough for the new world that you live in. Because all at once new things have come into your life, new romances, New marriages, new careers, new children, new grandchildren. You know, you got to yield your grandchildren, too. You know what I'm saying? You got to give them up, too. New, new, maybe you're, 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 you're getting, re getting ready to retire or recently retired. Who does your, you know, we live in this world like all of us. When we retire, our retirement belongs to us. You know, my whole life long, I lived for Jesus, but now I retired. Now, what, what am I retiring from? I'm retiring from, you know, uh, this task I had, but I, I don't How many of you know that the same Jesus who owned you as a young man, young woman, is the same Jesus who owns you when you're 66 year old? You with me? It's the same Jesus. And, and my retirement, just in the same way as I said to the Lord every day, this belongs to you, I'm following you. So now because I retired from my job all at once, it's like I'm free to do anything I want. I'm not free to do anything I want. I can only do what I would always have been able to do, which is to serve him and follow him and obey him. Are you with me? My life is not my own. It's been bought with a price, the blood of Jesus Christ. That didn't change when I got retired. And yet... Now, when my retirement came, I had to come to a new place of surrender. This belongs to you, Lord, just like it all belongs to you. When my kids were growing up, I would tell them the story 
of the Moravians who experienced an incredible revival in the 1700s. Absolutely amazing. Matter of fact, they had the revival was so powerful that they had a prayer meeting that got started and ran for 100 years continuously. It's known in church history as the 100 year prayer meeting. Prayer meeting ran for 100 years, right? Amazing. But one of the things that happened as these people became passionately filled with Jesus' heart is they got a burden for world missions. And, and the burden was so meaningful, so powerful, that from the small community that they had, there came two guys who rose up. One of them was a carpenter. One of them was a potter. Both of them were people who had been discipled there in their community. And both of these guys came to the place that they wanted to bring the gospel to the, to the people in the West Indies, the slaves of the West Indies. But to, the, the price of a ticket was more than anyone could afford. There was no way they could get there. And so they came up with a plan. And the plan was to sell themselves into slavery so that they would be carried to the West Indies so that they could um, uh, preach the gospel to these people in the West Indies. And so that's exactly what they did. And it came time to the the morning that their ship was getting ready to leave, and they were on the, the, uh, the edge of the ship as the people gathered in the harbor to say goodbye to them. And they knew what was in the minds of everyone that was on the shore. Because the thing that was in their minds was, why are you doing this? Why would you sell yourself into slavery to go to a people you don't know have no relationship with, and to try to preach the gospel to them and 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 as the ship began to pull away these two men shouted from the side of the ship to win for the lamb the reward of his suffering to win for the lamb the reward of his suffering well, as the years went by, my oldest son, Toby, grew up and ultimately felt a call to missions. And he leads a ministry you've, I'm sure you've probably heard of, Campus Target, and uh, spent extensive time, uh, 15 years, in, in China. And back a few years ago, they had been gone for several years one of my grandchildren had been born in China. I had never, never seen the, the child. And they decided they were going to come back one summer for five weeks. They were going to be a part of a wedding and, and, and be with us. And, and it was, wow, what a summer that was. We were so excited. My, little, my two little granddaughters and my brand new grandson who I'd never met before, and they, they were all back with us. And we had picnics. All the family was there. My other son, Todd, and his wife and their couple kids, and, and my daughter, Tracy, and all the family. You know, and we would have, we had picnics, and we went to parks together. And we just did, for five weeks, it was just like we just did everything we could to connect with them and to be with them. And it came down to the end. They were going to leave on the following Tuesday, and it was Sunday. And we had decided to have a, a party at the house and, and uh, just to hang out together and be together. And we were, we were there together during that time. And Now, remember, the goodbye was supposed to be on Tuesday. But here we are on that night, and my son Todd says to Toby... He says, Toby, he says, I'm not going to be able to be there to say goodbye to you. I've got a business trip this week. He said, so I just wanted to say goodbye to you right now. We're getting ready to leave. I just wanted to say goodbye to you right now. And so he goes over to Toby, and he hugs him. Now, I am not prepared for this because... Tuesday is goodbye day. This is like we all are still loving each other and for trying to pretend that nothing's changing. And he goes over and he hugs them, and they start crying. And then, you know, everybody else starts crying. And we're, now we're in the place and we're just all sobbing, saying goodbye to each other. And so finally, they, everybody leaves the house. And I look over at my wife and I say to her, there is no way 
I can go to the airport. I said, I, I just can't do it. There's no way. At that time, I, my granddaughter, she was about five years old, and, and she had these curly, she looked like, she looked like uh, Shirley Temple, little blonde, you know, curly little thing. And, I, and she was smart enough to realize they were going to be leaving grandpa and grandpa and, you know, all this stuff. And, you know, I could just envision them going through security and her looking back going, Grandpa, don't let him take me! You know, and I'm just saying to myself, I cannot do it. I said, there is no way I can go. This killed me tonight. There is no way I can go to that airport Tuesday morning. And so finally, Tuesday morning comes. And I'm sitting in the house my wife is gone. She's braver than me. Say goodbye to them. I just couldn't do it. I just told them, you know, I'd gone over on Monday night and said goodbye. And, and, and you know, I just said, I can't do it. I'm sorry. I just can't do it. And so they're, they're leaving. And so my, my son sends me a text from the airplane. And this is what he says. About to leave for Shanghai. Why do we do this again? Oh, yeah dot, 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 to win for the Lamb the reward of his suffering. To win for the Lamb the reward of his suffering. Listen, brothers and sisters, it doesn't matter how recently you gave your life to Christ or how far away it was. It doesn't matter how mature you are or how immature you are. I'm telling you, we're all in the same boat when it comes to this. I had to come to a place of yielding my grandchildren again in that situation, yielding my children to the nations of the world. The commitment I had made, I had done it years before, but that, over time, that commitment deteriorates, and there is a fresh commitment that's required, a fresh commitment. Now, I don't know what area it might be, uh, the worship team, if you want to come to start getting prepared, you can do that right now. I don't know what area it might be for you, right? Do you, do you, do you need to reestablish your relationship with Jesus? Maybe you say, no, that's, that's, that's pretty good. But, but I'm saying to you, is he still number one? In the new world that you live in, in the new moments that you live in, is he still number one? Has God been speaking to you about your finances? Maybe he's been talking to you about debt-free living, or maybe he's been talking to you about honoring the Lord with the tithe in some kind of a way. He's been dealing with you on, on some kind of an issue. There, has to, there is a new, you, you may have given your life to Christ. That was real. It was genuine. It was authentic. It's good. But that is not going to hold you for today. Is there a missionary you need to support? Or, or do you, maybe you've said, you know, I don't mind sending money to those missionaries, but I will never go myself. Maybe the Lord is telling you, you need to go as these bands are lifted. You need to go to another nation. Is there a person you need to talk to that you've just said, you know, I'm, I, I, if they want to talk, they're going to have to talk to me. They, I'm not going to say, I'm not going to, I'm not going to say I'm sorry. I said I'm sorry. I'm not, I'm not going to, and that the Lord is dealing with you. And he's calling you to a new commitment. Would you just bow your head right now? You know, as I've been speaking, I believe that the Holy Spirit has been speaking to you quite separate from me. Your mind has been racing, and as I've been talking about these different illustrations and examples, you, you're, you, the Holy Spirit has been going, you know, this relates to you. This deals, this is something happening in you. You know, this is something I'm speaking to you. And if the Lord has been speaking to you one specific thing, There's been something that's come into your mind, some issue, majorly. Well, as we go into this next time of worship, 
I want you just to release that thing. I want you to surrender, and I want you to recommit. You haven't done anything wrong. It's just the fact that little by little, it deteriorates. And the only way you can keep your salt salty is to replenish it through a fresh commitment. A fresh commitment right now. So as that comes into your heart, when we stand to sing, you just, you just surrender that thing. You recommit yourself right now. You know what it is. The Holy Spirit's been faithful to you. He's speaking to you. It might be a relationship that you need to yield to him. It might be some demand you have, something you feel you're owed, you need to let go of. Though you know what it is. The Holy Spirit is bringing you to a fresh place of surrender and commitment.